In this session, we're going to dive into actionable techniques tailored to enhance membership recruitment and retention, from leveraging digital platforms to fostering community engagement. Attendees, which is you, will gain practical insights and best practices to drive your membership growth. And of course, we've got a guest expert here to lead us through this. So I'm really excited here that we've got Wade Jacks, who is a co-founder of Communal. Wade has built Communal, which is this all-in-one technology solution designed specifically for nonprofits to manage their membership programs, their event facilities, their volunteering, and their donations. For the last five years, he's collaborated with innovative member-based nonprofits, becoming an expert in their unique needs. Now, he's super eager to leverage this knowledge and expertise to help nonprofits maximize their impact with, it, with the aid of technology. I'm the co-founder of Communal, and we'll, we'll talk about Communal in just a moment, but it's more today about sharing the learnings that we see from all the different organizations that are using our all-in-one system, taking a lot of those insights and then bringing them back to everyone here today. Like I said, I spent a lot of time working with member-based nonprofits and helping them in these different areas. So hopefully some of these ideas here are helpful today and we'll kind of jump right into things. As Eli, I already introduced myself. I've been in the nonprofit industry for over 10 years now. Before I was the co-founder of Communal, I worked at Benevity. Some people might know Benevity and received even some donations from Benevity. It's a charitable giving software here out of Calgary, which I'm also from. Spent many years in the technology space as well as the nonprofit and charitable industry, working, like I said, directly with nonprofits on these core issues. And a little bit about communal, just so you have that lens as we dive into things here. So it is a nonprofit solution that has been designed to help organizations manage their memberships, their programs, their events, their volunteering, their facility rentals, and their donations all in one. Uh, so we started this back in 2018 after we were trying to book a space at our local community association here in Calgary. Notice it was quite a cumbersome experience as we started to engage with the organization more to try to get our membership and book events and things like that. So they actually let us know that they were trying to find a solution to do everything all in one. And through that, we became partner with them and they were our first nonprofit that helped design the solution. Now we're working with over 300 different nonprofits throughout North America uh, and taking some of those learnings here today uh, and diving specifically more into the membership space. Okay, so the plan for today is we're going to start with looking at some of the foundational elements that go to growing your membership. And that's really going to be in two kind of lens when we're thinking about your membership retention and your membership app acquisition. So everything's going to be structured in that uh, way. And at the start, we're going to look at membership structure. So we're going to think, are, do we have the right membership structure for your organization? And we're just going to be thinking about some of the different aspects that go into that. Sometimes that hasn't been looked at in your bylaws since you first formed your membership or your nonprofit, or maybe you're looking to form a membership structure. We can talk about some of the ideas and things that we're seeing of ways that people can even just increase their membership through updating their structure. The next thing we're going to be talking about is really thinking about the value that you're bringing to your members. So what is the reason for them to get a membership and what can, are you bringing back to them? And we want to do this in the lens that's not just transactional in the sense of these are the benefits they're getting, it's more what is the true value, which is subjective, but we'll do our best with data and insights to ensure that we're uh, giving the best value back to our members to increase retention year over year. We're going to think about the engagement strategy in our online presence, how to make this a seamless experience for individuals and some of the best practices I see from groups that have a really strong, successful uh, membership processes. And then finally, we'll touch on the membership management and technology aspects, which is really our kind of bread and butter because that's what we do. And that's how we're engaging with the nonprofits that we support. So we can give you some best practices that we see uh, from groups that are leveraging a uh, member management system and some of the benefits that come from that. And then finally, talking about some of the impact that we see when we bring all these ideas together. Okay. So as a starting point, like I mentioned, let's talk a little bit about membership structure. And this might be something that's overlooked at times because like I said, it might be something you haven't looked at in your bylaws for quite some time. Uh, but we want to think about 
is this the best membership structure for your nonprofit? And is it worth looking at updating things? Or like I said, if you're looking to design your membership, which is the best that model that could align with what your needs are? And first thing I want to touch on was rolling versus annual memberships. Now, and for those that aren't familiar with rolling memberships, those are the ones that expire a year after purchase. And the other, and an annual one would be more tied to perhaps your fiscal year or the calendar year. Now, a lot of organizations that we're seeing are trying to move towards rolling memberships if it makes sense for their organization. And this right might resonate with some people here if they do have uh, annual memberships. You may find that there's periods where people aren't engaging with your organization, especially if you have paid memberships in the aspect that later in the year, towards the expiration date of that membership, you might find that there's a drop off of people buying because they don't want to buy a membership that's only going to last them for four months or half the year, for example. Even if you're offering benefits like member pricing for events and programs and things like that, you might still find that drop off. Uh, so a lot of people are trying to move to rolling memberships when it does make sense for them so they can have natural uh, flowing memberships year after year. But the thing that usually inhibits that move is automating your expiration reminders. So even if it's difficult to have a, bullet, a membership director send out expiration reminders if you don't have a technology system that aligns with that. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on in kind of the membership management aspect of the presentation here today. But I was just going to mention that a lot of people are trying to roll, go towards rolling memberships and they're seeing kind of some natural growth from that because it gives a balanced membership structure throughout the year. The next thing is thinking about a tier of membership structure, which you might already have, but just especially once again for paid memberships to allow a different range of uh, prices and tiers. So your, your whole kind of uh, audience that you're reaching out to can resonate with your different membership options, whether it's family or couple or senior memberships or sponsorship levels, whatever it might be. Some of the ones that have the best structures that we see have a nice tier of membership options. So someone can align with kind of everything that's being offered in the community. The next one that sometimes is overlooked is more individual versus corporate memberships. We see a lot of people succeeding with corporate memberships as a two facet strategy. One of it being a, it just can help grow your memberships. If you do open up a special corporate or business membership that people can engage with. It allows the local businesses to support your community and say, yes, I believe in your mission. I want to help cheer you on and be part of your organization. It also can create a two-way street where if you're bringing them in, perhaps you can put those local businesses uh, into your newsletters or uh, things as well. If you are in more of a geographic area, you could also partner with these businesses and have them sell memberships on your behalf. So we see a lot of successful groups that will set up QR codes in local businesses. So that if someone, maybe they get even get a discount at that local business if they're a member of your organization, uh, and then you, that business can sell the membership right there as well. So just raising kind of some general awareness of your mission and your organization uh, through this kind of corporate structure. So something that some groups might've been thinking about, but uh, we've seen some good success from organizations that are doing that. The other one to look at is lifetime memberships. So something that you might want to look at is rewarding those long-term members or those key volunteers or people on your board that have been around for a long time with a lifetime membership, both giving them that great incentive and showing them that we appreciate all your efforts year after year. And we can talk about it a little bit more when we get into the membership management content is Usually you do want a way to help you manage these lifetime members so that they do stay relevant and you know who is still engaged with your organization year after year. And then finally, membership by donation. So this is a really popular one that we see uh, groups using is that perhaps you might even have paid memberships or you have an intent where you have a set of paid memberships as well. You have a choice for membership by donation. Even if all your membership is, let's say you want to have people register to be a volunteer, you might call them a member. So you know who's engaged every single year. You make them renew, even if it's a free membership. But by having that donation option tied to it, we, we do see uh, some nice growth there. And it really helps reduce any uh, financial barrier to join. So people can pick and choose what aligns their uh, financial situation. 
We had an interesting story out of Calgary where a local organization had $25 memberships and they actually moved completely to membership by donation. And they saw a membership growth by having lower barriers as well. They saw an increase of the average membership purchase actually turned out to be $33 as opposed to 25. So interesting to see that it both increased their memberships as well as offered a, a way to create a little bit more revenue for the organization as well. Okay. So now that we've gone through the structure of the membership, which is something that we probably all are familiar with, we want to spend more time on the value to members, which is probably, I'd say, the most important aspect to consider when we're looking at membership acquisition and retention. Like I said, we want to remove the concept of just transactional memberships, like you have to be a member to vote at our organization, or you, if you get, become a member, then you get all these great perks and discounts. Those are important as well, and that can be part of your strategy. But I'd say the most important one is gathering the insights of why this person joined your organization in the first place. We really want to know why do they align with your mission? What's what spoke out to them and had them raise their hand saying, yes, I really actually want to be part of this organization because that's going to set up your content marketing strategy in the next steps that we'll go into in just a moment. So it's really important. What the best groups that I see do is as people are registering to be a member, they're collecting this information. They're collecting what's the programs of, or programs and events that are interest to you, or is it volunteering? Is it fundraising? What are the areas that made you put your hand up to be part of our great nonprofit? Because we want to capture that and then keep pushing it to ensure that we're resonating with these organizations or these individuals. So we'll talk about that a little bit more, but like I said, that's usually really important in your registration process is ensuring you're getting that information and we'll talk about some of the best ways to uh, use it in, in positive ways that don't add more administrative burden onto your volunteer team, your board, or your staff. Now, some of these other ideas, these ones are a little bit more transactional, but we do see that they work and we have some data in one of our case studies that we're going to be looking at that shows the power of some of these exclusive content and exclusive events or discounts and perks for members, especially for our system, because our system is meant to handle both membership registration and program and event management. We know who's a member so we can provide automated discounts for programs and events or certain resources that are available to your members. So that is a really just popular one that, that people will use as a way to push for greater membership acquisition. For example, if you have an event or a social that might be coming up, you might want to display that members get a discount to it. Some people even go as far as offering a, an additional discount to people that choose to volunteer for that program or event. And our system is meant to help you with that as well. So it both grows your membership numbers as well as your volunteer engagement. Something that a classic one there of providing some discounts. The next one we want to look at is your community and social connections. So we know that bringing people together is the most powerful way to grow your memberships. Uh, as to if you can have those in-person experiences or virtual, bringing people together so they can hear directly from your board or your champions about your mission. So trying to make sure you're offering those opportunities for them to get involved, whether it's through a fundraiser or volunteering or whatever it might be. And I see a lot of groups trying to encourage people also to bring their kind of their friends and their colleagues or share it at their work and things like that to really drive, uh, to push for more acquisition and uh, more acknowledgement of your great mission that you're working on. Okay, so this next portion is going to be more about your online presence and your engagement strategy. And a part of it will fall back to that uh, value that we were talking about, where we really want to make sure we're getting the insights from our members to know why they joined our organization or uh, aligned with our mission in the first place. But the first one is pretty obvious, and it, but it's sometimes overlooked by groups is that you want to just make sure that you do have a, a modern website that's mobile responsive so people can uh, look it on their phones, or quickly find it on Google. So if you haven't updated your website in a while, it might be worth spending some time. There's lots of drag and drop options now with Squarespace and Wix and those great website builders uh, to make sure that you have a modern web experience because that will set the stage for some of these things that will happen after. 
You just want to make sure that you're very clear with your mission and everything that your organization is doing. So we have the opportunity to push for more members to come in. One specific thing that people might not know about is Google ad grants. If you, if you're unaware, every nonprofit is eligible through Google for a $10,000 a month for Google ad credits. These help you get your nonprofit to the top of Google when people are searching for your keywords or your organization name. It's meant to help you get your organization higher ranked on Google without having to pay for those normal ads that a for-profit organization would have to pay for. It's something to consider for your board to look at if you haven't done it before is leveraging those grants. It really does just help with more awareness, especially through Google of your organizations. I would recommend looking at that one if you haven't in the past. So this next one is welcome emails. And this kind of will also touch on some of our engagement strategy and kick off some of the kind of the marketing items that we'll be looking at. But some of the most successful groups that we've seen will send a welcome email as soon as someone registers to be a, a member. So they'll give them that key value right away of next steps of how to stay engaged with the organization. So they might send a message that is about upcoming events or volunteer opportunities or fundraisers, or even just benefits that you get, or some of the great things that your nonprofit is working on at the moment and how they can put their hand up and get involved if they wish. It's just a way to take that first step towards we've gone through, they've become a member, which is amazing, but we want to make sure they're engaged. It's going back to that value piece. We want to make sure they're still engaged with our nonprofit. And it's not just a transactional name on a spreadsheet. So we'll talk about in, in the technology section of how we might be able to automate the welcome email. So it's not a daunting task for the team, uh, but just something to consider that uh, I, I do see a lot of successful groups sending that welcome email to get people engaged, especially when it comes to volunteering. Uh, that's a big one that we see really does help work. Even if it's just getting them to send, sign up for a volunteering training session. Every month you might have a, a training session that people volunteer, sign up for and it gets them in your pipeline of now we're going to get them to be a long-term volunteer. Okay. So moving towards value-driven email marketing, and that is going to be more in line with the value to members that we were talking about. So we gained all that great insight as people were registering. We understand now why they want to be part of our mission, what they're looking for, uh, whether why they joined our nonprofit in the first place. And if we build those preset categories in that kind of registration question, we can use those answers to then push that information into our marketing system. So this is where, and then we'll talk about a little bit more when we get into once again, the technology section, because we can do some integrations. For example, you might capture this information in your membership management system, tag your individuals, and then push it into your MailChimp if you're using systems like that. So then you can send your content to ensure it's aligned with people's areas of interest. Cause we, as we know, we all get a lot of noise in our emails. So if you can align your email marketing strategy to the best way you can with the value that the person is looking to get from your organization, you'll see a better response rate from those either newsletters or volunteering updates or call to actions for fundraising and calls to, for donations, whatever it might be really taking that data that you captured and align it to your marketing strategy could be helpful. Okay. This next one is about is for Canadian nonprofits specifically, and it's the Canadian anti-spam legislation that a lot of people will call uh, castle. Not everyone might be aware of this, but you do not need to ask for consent, uh, to email individuals if they're a member of your organization or your, of your nonprofit. So this is a special thing for nonprofits in Canada. A lot of people will, that I've seen in the past in part of that registration flow will ask if they can, if you as an organization can send them email content. And a lot of people will say no, just because we, as a society now, we get a lot of emails. So people can sometimes default to clicking no. But that kind of loses out on some of that value-driven content marketing that I was just speaking about. If We already lost them right away before we even had a chance to engage with them. Something that you might want to consider is you don't ne necessarily have to ask for that consent because through Canadian anti-spam legislation, if they're a member of your organization, you get implied consent, which means you can email them. However, you always have to give them the option to unsubscribe. 
people that can unsubscribe at any time, but hopefully if we're doing the right content marketing strategy, using that value, they're going to be more likely to stay on and not uh, unsubscribe from those messages. Uh, but just something to consider because you might be able to increase your uh, marketing content if you uh, eliminate that question that you were asking. Okay, so, and then finally, this, the membership drives, this is more for kind of geographically located nonprofits that might serve a specific area. Uh, we work with a lot of neighborhood associations and community associations here as well. And I will say that membership drives still work. So if you do have the opportunity for a geographic location to have someone go around and meet the community, share your messaging, uh, it, it still does help drive uh, membership. We don't want to, even though we live in kind of the virtual world here, even as we're doing this presentation, that in-person connection really still does work. And we'll talk about some ways that technology can help you make that more effective and efficient. So someone's not recording membership information manually. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but if you do have the ability to do more physical uh, drives, we do still see that it's a, a successful method. Okay. So now we're going to be looking at membership management systems and how we can take some of these ideas and apply it in a, in a system. So the idea here is that we talked about some core concepts there, but we don't want to add more burden onto your board or your volunteers uh, because we know it does take time to manage your memberships. So we're going to be looking at some of these ideas and the reasons that uh, a lot of groups will move towards having a sophisticated membership management system and moving away from things like PayPal and Excel or spreadsheets or Google Sheets. So the idea is to get yourself a, a membership management system and make life a little bit easier. Now, the first one as one of the benefits is a better experience for your members. So something sometimes overlooked is that people nowadays can expect things to be online. You have even steps that say that you have to e-transfer or complete a payment, uh, even through PayPal or some of these things. Sometimes even just those one extra steps can remove someone who was uh, going to become a member of your organization. You might lose them along the way. As well, if you have too complicated of, of a situation where maybe you have to submit a Google form with all our questions, so we could do that, that email marketing that we're talking about, but then they have to also register to be a member. We want to make it all in one and clear and concise so people have a nice, smooth experience. So that's what our system's meant to do. And that's what we see people leveraging is you can handle the registration and the payment if you do have paid memberships all in one. And we do see it uh, leads to more benefits overall. Something that's often overlooked as well is thinking about time saving. So if your membership director or whoever's currently managing memberships at your organization, if having to do that manual data step that I was alluding to, if you're spending time in spreadsheets and Excel, something that's often overlooked is the opportunity cost of not spending time growing your mission and getting your messaging or highlighting great volunteers that you might have or running fundraisers. We sometimes, we didn't join the board to just do data entry. So it's not always thought about, but you, there is an opportunity cost there. So we want to make sure we can automate a lot of those steps. So the person who's managing these different areas can get to the more exciting aspects of your nonprofit and helping push your great message out and your mission. So more groups, more individuals can align with you. Do think about time that's being spent on some of these areas and see if there's ways that you can improve it. Because if you can automate a lot of it, then you can have more time to grow your organization overall. One other great aspect of having kind of the membership management system is thinking about your auto rules and your automated expiration reminders. We'll start just quickly on the automated expiration reminders because that rolls back to those rolling memberships that I was talking about. A lot of people want to go into rolling memberships, but they don't know how to because of the expiration reminders. We need to still remind people that their memberships expired so we keep our retention rates high. If you have a system that can automate those reminders, you can then open the door to moving to rolling memberships, which naturally often increases memberships overall. Another aspect to think about is auto renewals. So we see among all our organizations, the ones that have enabled auto renewal have a 64% median growth rate year over year, where those without auto renewal have around 25%. So that's a pretty big jump in terms of retention. 
So some of those other aspects that we were looking at were all about membership acquisition, where this one specifically tied to retention, which is just as important when you're looking at membership growth overall. So if you're not currently leveraging auto renewal for your memberships, even if you have free members and it's only for voting rights and things like that, still might be something to consider and looking into uh, to make your life a little bit easier. And I will highlight one really important thing with the membership management solution, solution when you're thinking about auto renewals is it's important to give those people a chance to, to remove their auto renewal. We all know that we've been slipped into situations where we signed up for something and we forgot about it. And then all of a sudden we've been auto renewed on something that we didn't plan on engaging with again. And it can create a ne negative kind of overall experience. And we don't want that. We're here to create positive kind of uh, work in the community. So make sure your membership management system sends reminders for people before the auto renewal period comes that they can make adjustments. They can cancel it if they need to. So you still provide that great overall experience for the individual while still gaining all the benefits of auto renewal. Next, we want to touch on the automated welcome emails. So this is tying back to what I was talking about before, which is one thing that we see that is really popular is people sending out that welcome email as soon as someone registers with kind of next steps. And I do recommend something you'll want to look at automating that. So that's what our system is meant to do as well, is you can build an automated welcome email that goes out. A lot of groups will change this perhaps every quarter, like they might put some upcoming volunteer opportunities they have or fundraisers or some great mission items that they're working on to push their nonprofit forward or just general ways that the individual can get engaged. Like I was saying, where it might even be a link to general volunteering training so then we get someone in as a volunteer. I, I do recommend looking at that automated welcome email as a direct next step after someone registers as a call to action to get them from, because from there, then we can push for them to engage in other ways it is something to consider. But like I said, we don't want to add too much administrative burden. We want to make it easy to send those messages out. Okay, continuing on with some of the benefits of the membership management system and things to consider, if you do want to look at leveraging this type of technology for your nonprofit. And the first one is membership cards. So some people here might already be leveraging membership cards at their organization, but hopefully if you're not having to do it by hand or sending them out because we, we do hear from groups that previously were making membership cards manually and then setting them. It's a lot easier if you leverage that through a digital system where people can download it into their wallet, on their phone, or they could still get a PDF version that they could print. And the membership cards can be used in different ways. It can be used at, at events or at your AGM to check who has voting and non-voting rights. Uh, once again, you can go all the way even back to that local businesses, that idea that if you are allowing discounts in the community, you'll want to have a kind of a membership system, a membership card system that aligns with that. Uh, so something you might want to consider. And and adds that little bit of professionalism as well, that people get excited when they get their card to become a member of your organization. It's something that you might want to look at adding if you haven't in the past. The other thing, one of the positives is this is a little bit in line with both on the time saving aspect again, is if you use a membership management system, you can allow your members to manage their own information. So every year, your team, your membership director is not having to come in, edit that spreadsheet or put a call out to see if people have moved or they want a different email address entered. By giving them an area that they can edit that their own information, it will lower kind of the burden on your team. As well, this is what our kind of system, like I was saying, is meant to do. It gives that all-in-one hub for members where they can sign up for volunteer opportunities, make donations, sign up for programs, whatever it might be. You can make a little a little member hub where people see what's going on in your organization and feel like they're involved. So it does make a nice experience for them to have that. The other big aspect is tracking your growth. So we talked about a lot of strategies when we're looking at email marketing or call to actions to get people to engage with our great nonprofit. But if we're not monitoring our growth, over kind of month over month, it's hard to know what's actually working. 
So if you're just doing all these great ideas, that's wonderful. And you might just see a natural bump in your membership growth. But what can be even more useful is if you can track some of those activities that you're doing and then look year over year at your membership growth. So if, let's say we did a big membership drive with some local businesses in the springtime. And we noticed that we can now cart our members a lot easier and see, okay, we had this many sales in April of 2024 compared to April of 2023. Uh, what did we do that was a little bit different? How's our retention rate looking now that we've enabled auto renewals? Things like that. You can really start to unlock more stories about your nonprofit if you're using a system that allows you to get that information. Next thing I wanted to highlight as well is the leveraging the QR codes. So a lot of groups now are leveraging QR codes to uh, handle especially physical sales of their memberships. Even if they're free memberships, they don't necessarily have to be paid. It's really helpful even at AGMs if people are coming in and if at your AGM you have people can register to be a member and you have someone sitting at a desk trying to take all the information down of everyone that they're going to later have to add to a spreadsheet. QR codes make a really nice seamless experience for everyone where they can just register right away on their phone, enter their information. If you do have paid memberships, they can even make their a payment right there. Maybe you even allow the donation idea that I was talking about and they can get their tax receipt right away, building for a really positive situation. So making a QR code that goes directly to your membership buying page, whether it's on your website or your member management system, whatever it is, uh, can be used in different ways. I was talking about where if someone's going door to door, you can leverage that QR code and get people to buy right at their door. So just some ideas there that we've seen that have worked out really well. And then finally going to the integration. So if you're leveraging a member, a modern membership management system, it, quite often it should be able to integrate with other systems so you can further enhance your overall strategy. Part of that idea being, I spoke about collecting all that great information during the membership registration experience. Now you've categorized or tagged these individuals in your system. What are we going to do next? So you can leverage if you need to. Maybe you want to connect it with your MailChimp, like I was alluding to, if you do, or your constant contact, whatever your email marketing system, if you are using one, you can integrate it directly so you don't have to manage two databases and try to figure all of that out. Instead, you can push it to those databases and it allows you to make your kind of content marketing strategy more effective and not a huge burden on your team trying to manage all these different data sets and tags and lists. Now, if people say they are interested in certain information, like volunteer opportunities, you can tag them as such and then make sure they're receiving that information in your email marketing tools. Using an online system really does help you set the stage for that level of integration. Okay, so as we wrap up here in some of these ideas, I want to show two case studies with some data uh, to, from all the organizations and nonprofits that are in our system. So we categorized some and found out um, what it looks like for groups that are doing member pricing for their programs and events versus ones that are not doing member pricing. And we noticed that this is the year over year membership median growth rate. So we can see that the ones that are offering member pricing had a growth rate around, let's say 23% from 2020 to 2021. And the ones without it were around 13%, so almost like a 10% difference in offering member pricing to help strive or push growth. Very similar numbers in 2021 to 2022, around a 10% difference between 25% and 15% growth. And then finally, an even bigger gap uh, from 2022 to 2023. So just showing that uh, member pricing for your programs and events uh, does just as a kind of a passive way to grow memberships, it does work year over year. And then finally, wanted to look at one specific organization and how they grew both their member acquisition through some of these ideas, as well as their retention rate. So they did all this great work to acquire a bunch of members and they were then able to retain them at a high rate. So what they did is they, first they needed the automatic renewals and the automatic expiration reminders that really uh, pushed up their uh, retention rates. They offered member discounts for their programs and events. This organization, this was a community association in Calgary. They had things like yoga classes or Zumba. 
they offered special member rates for them and pushed things up. And as well as a little bit more of a specific example for this nonprofit specifically, but they had tennis and pickleball courts that became bookable through our system and we helped automate the gate code so only members could engage with their organization in that manner. So if you do have a physical location that you can offer member discounts, even for space rentals and things like that, uh, that can go a long way as well. So you can see they went from having around 50 members in 20, pretty exciting growth just from implementing some of these membership strategies uh, and changing their content marketing as well. Okay, so those are some of the findings that we have from working with, like I said, over 300 different nonprofits that are all member-based and bringing some of those concepts to life but would love to hear from the community here and what people are striving to do and what type of memberships they have and happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Wade. That's a really great overview of some of the strategies and techniques nonprofits can use to boost their memberships. I encourage you to throw some questions into the chat. So Alexia says, have you worked with any museums and, and what have you learned from them? Are they the same? Are they different from other kinds of nonprofits? We, oh, it's a good question. We haven't worked with any museums specifically. We've worked with some cultural organizations that sometimes call themselves museums for whatever reason, but I'd say we haven't worked with classical museums in that sense before. But I uh, would, would love to learn more about that space uh, and seeing what's going on there. Awesome. Here's another question coming in from Hannah, who says, one of our biggest issues is attracting members to come to our AGM. Let's speak about the AGM or, or the AGM doesn't work. Our AGM is virtual and needs 50 members in attendance for quorum. Even though we have over 2,000 members, our last AGM only met quorum. Do you have some ideas around like, how do you get people to show up? You can actually do your legal governance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think part of that might come from the kind of the, a, the email marketing is seeing if people are interested in voting in part of the voting capacity of the organization. And if you're targeting those individuals and getting that information to say, okay, I've highlighted that I know these individuals are really interested in driving more the governance side of our organization. Perhaps then we can send messages to them and say, hey, you had put your hand up and said that governance and where we're going as an organization is really important to you. Guess what? We want to have you have the first opportunity to register because we want to make sure that you're here and present. Uh, it's really important to hear your voice at the organization. Even just that little bit of specialization and making them feel heard can go a really long way because they're make, you're making them feel a little kind of special that it wasn't right. just an annual call to action that went to everybody that we are AGMs coming up. You highlighted specifically a group of people that about that topic could be something that you want to look at in, in part of your kind of content management strategy. Yeah. I think that special outreach is really helpful. The other thing I've seen from my girlfriend, who's on the association of fundraising professionals who have the same challenge is they basically mix candy in with the vegetable. So they now tie their AGM to their annual mentorship celebration as well. So we, they give people another reason to show up, even if they're not governance nerd, but while they're there, we have warm bodies to help us with Quora. So that's been some of their mm. approach as well. That's really smart. What are some of the strategies for moving members who sometimes think of themselves as, oh, I gave, like, I'm contributing in this, this mm. way but to bring them in to be donors as well. So to also contribute with their pocketbook. Mm -hmm. No, and it's a good question. And I, I'd say it's the same that we see on the volunteering aspects as well as how do we drive for people to become uh, volunteers. Uh, one of them that I, I do see on the donor side is those that strategy of those welcome emails, you, if you do have a fundraiser at the moment, if you're trying to raise money for a certain topic and you can, and cause then you can explain the importance of whatever's going on at the organization. Cause what we find is stories drive donations. That was something we really learned at Benevity in my time there as well, that yes, it's important that the mission and everything that's going on at your organization, some specific stories of what's happening and people can then relate to and resonate with could be important. So 
even to have that membership by donation option, or even an option that as someone's, because our system can do this and we do see it, that as someone's buying or getting their membership, you can also push for a donation and give a little blurb of what that donation goes towards specifically. And you're now establishing that the, now a donor in your kind of uh, CRM or your, you know, your client uh, relations management system, and you're tagging them as such. From there, you can then build your regular marketing strategy that might come after, after that person is given to just let them know what their donation went towards and all the great outfits it had. And usually it comes down to the communicating with that person, making them feel heard that I'll see tied to the donor in a natural way where it's not just you became a member. We're now asking for money. It's we're more story driven and showing impact. So I've got another sort of sector specific question because you do get to touch so many different organizations. Are you seeing something unique or different about how membership works within arts and cultural organizations? Yes. So let me look at, I see that question here. So I see, yeah, so I see a lot of cultural, if it's in our aspect, a lot of groups, let's say the Austrian society in, in Calgary or the, the Italian center in Vancouver. It's a group of individuals that are gathering together that share a kind of a cultural lens. And those are the ones that we see quite often. And their memberships will come with a lot of different perks. A, it's about enhancing that culture and bringing people together. It's making people feel welcome, whether it's newcomers to a city or it's people that have been around for a while, but bringing people with shared experiences together. So those memberships I see are often quite social. If you're getting a membership to join this almost social club, and then your marketing strategy really is about bringing people together and finding ways to be able to make their own connections and feel like they have a community of people that align with their culture. So it, it's more on kind of the nationalistic side of cultures that, that we work with quite often in various cities. Awesome. That's really helpful. Here's a question from Victoria who asked a question, which I think you're very well suited to answer, which is basically in their organization, renewal right now of memberships is manual. Doesn't sound like any fun. Could you suggest software for helping with automatic renewal? And is this automation only around the payment stuff or can you collect the other information around membership? No, great question. That's what our system communal is really meant to do. That's what we've designed it to do is that it's a membership management system that you can come in, the person's registering, and then as they're registering, they are deciding if they want to be on automatic renewal or not. It's not something that's forced on the individual. They're opting into it. And then every year they get a reminder that says, you're on automatic renewal. You have an opportunity now to update your information if you'd like. So they can come in, they can change their address or their email or some of their marketing that they want to receive. Or if they, you have like family memberships, then you can adjust your family members information. And the big one that we see is, is pushing for volunteering areas of interest. Which areas are you interested in volunteering with at the organization it captures that every year. So it handles both the payment aspect if there is one, but it also is a way to engage with that person again and making sure that A, their information is still up to date and giving them a chance to update it if you have to, uh, but B, reminding them about the great things that you're doing again. And our system even sets up where, if, you know how I spoke about the welcome email every year, you can even make a custom renewal email that's different from a welcome email. A welcome email is welcoming someone that's brand new. A renewal email you want to thank them for your, their continued support of your organization. So you might want to automate that sense of it as well. So that's something that we can help with as part of the whole renewal process. So this renewal thing is actually really interesting to me. When you do the renewal process, how early should are you seeing people reach out to people? Is it something you could do a month out, a week out, the day of? Like how far ahead of the renewal process do you see people successfully starting with their mm. emails? Yeah, great question. So we have three automated emails that you can leverage in our system. And I'll talk about what people are doing for each one of them. So one people can do before the re renewal, which we we're talking about, and they can pick and choose when that one goes out. I usually see it 30 days or 15 days. Those are the most common ones. They're kind of in that natural window to say, 
pay. Just as a reminder, your membership is going to be firing on this date. The next one goes out day of if they haven't engaged with it. So now we're sending them another reminder to say, hey, just now your membership is actually expired. So you can come in and action it if you need to, if you do choose to renew. And then the final one, if they still haven't done anything, the final reminder goes, just so you know, your membership is still expired. If you do, if you are planning to come back and, and join our wonderful organization, click here to do. And that one, once again, usually goes out kind of 15 days after expiration, providing a natural window that isn't overwhelming the member. If you make it too short, people feel like they're just being blasted with automated emails saying, I got something two days before expiration, day of and after. That's too much. It felt a little forceful. Where the 30, day window feels natural. Cool. So often I've seen in communities that sometimes the most like hardcore membership group are those who had to jump through some hoops that had some kind of barriers to entry. And I'm wondering if you've seen within any of your clients that people have been putting up barriers to entry. So it's not just, oh, I just filled out a form, gave you $5, boom, I'm a member. But maybe you're like, I had to volunteer 10 hours before I could even be considered as a member. Are you seeing groups using that kind of approach? Hmm. Yeah, because it's interesting. A lot of the groups that we were have been working with previously, especially at some of these cultural associations and things like that, where you might have to, you know, show your lineage, show that you are a, a true Italian or something like that. And they have to send this information in and then the board might have to look at it and approve it or not. I'm finding a lot of groups that are moving away from that kind of model and instead doing more what I was talking about where we're tailoring, instead of putting up this barrier and saying, you have to volunteer five hours before we'll consider you as a member. Let's get you in the door, get you some marketing or some volunteer opportunities that might be of interest to you and send that to you and a, a natural uh, way to get you in. And then we'll engage your content from there. The one thing that I do see groups put up barriers for is the voting rights. In their bylaws, they might define their, you can join the organization, but until you do certain things, you won't have voting rights at our AGM. That creates a kind of a more natural barrier where we're still getting you in the door, making you feel involved, but we're protecting the organization uh, when it comes to. So there's like this two tiered level. Cause I think, yeah, that's sometimes the fear of some of the organizations I've been around who have been very resistant to open up membership. Is the fear of, oh, what if a cohort comes in and tries to take over leadership yeah. organization? Yes. And we have seen horror stories of that. So to protect against it, if you're going to, yeah, I say open it up for all, but if you do want to create some tech separation, do it on the voting rights and have that in your bylaws. Interesting. With that, thank you so much. I hope you all have a lovely afternoon and we'll see you all soon. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate all the great questions here today.